سيل عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته وي اي وود لايك تو ويلكم اول اوف يو فور ذيس سكوليوسيس ويبينار وي هاف سكس فيزيشن فروم اكروس ذا كونتري ويل شير وذ اس توداي ذير كيسز Uh, we will uh, our webinar today is focused on uh, sclerosis and deformity uh, we will start with dr ali ashari who is uh, anesthesia and pain uh, uh, consultant at uh, king fahad uh, medical city hospital in riyadh please uh, dr ali can you start bismillah rahman rahim thank you ahmed and thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity uh, to present today um, about a very complicated case uh, of um, kyphoscoliosis. And uh, the beauty of it is it involved multidisciplinary management. Uh, as you know, I'm an anesthesiologist uh, specialized in pain management. So uh, I'm gonna talk from my perspective, but it's, it's gonna touch on all uh, specialities. Okay, so um, this is KFMC for those who don't know it. Um, so our patient today is a 35-year-old uh, male, a Saudi, uh, from Al-Hassa. He's known to have Sherman's disease with progressive kyphoscoliosis. Now, just to recap, Sherman's disease is a, is a um, congenital uh, deformity of the spine which, in which the uh, posterior uh, I'll show you a picture. If you see here, this is a normal vertebrae, and this is um, the wedge-shaped uh, Sherman's disease, where the posterior end of the spine outgrow the anterior end. So this patient has got a progressive kyphoscoliosis. Uh, he presented uh, in 2013 to his local hospital with um, mid-back pain in the thoracic region following a road traffic accident which resulted in a um, stable fracture of his T10 uh, spine. His pain was uh, moderate to severe but localized. He also has got scoliosis with a thoracic Cobb's angle of 9 and a lumbar Cobb's angle of 13. So he saw his local um, also physician in Al Hassa, who advised sorry who advised um, conservative management uh, and um, who advised conservative management and he um, labeled him as a non-surgical candidate and he was managed initially with oral analgesics, thoracic epidural soft tissue injections. Uh, and um, there was unfortunately no relief of symptoms. So in March 2015, he decided to go to London, uh, England, where he saw a spine surgeon who advised him to have a corrective uh, spine surgery, extensive. So he did the T2 to L3 uh, corrective surgery with the application of particular screws and the application of transverse process hooks at T2 with rigid roils and osteotomy. Um, this is the uh, picture of um, post-operative. As you can see, pretty extensive surgery. Now, and this is the lumbar end. Also, he's got the, the screws. Now, unfortunately, um, in the post-operative period, the pain continued and was really severe. And he was unable to work. And he also had weakness of his left ankle. Um, so he referred to physiotherapy, rehabilitation, and pain management when he was in London. And they gave him um, a really... Um, good medications, lots of medications, as you can see, um, non-steroidals, um, muscle relaxants, uh, anti antidepressants, and uh, pregabalin, and um, all of this was not helping. So, um, in 20, uh, when he came back, sorry, when he came back um, from, uh, England, he was following up at John Hopkins Medical Center in Aramco, where uh, one of my colleagues, pain physicians, saw him and started him on opioids. 
uh, which was fentanyl patches and tramadol, but the pain was not uh, controlled. So in January 2017, he decided to go to Germany, to Frankfurt, and he was assessed by a spine surgeon. Uh, so he uh, advised him to remove all the plants that was uh, put in by the uh, fellow surgeon in London. And um, he recommended to have um, physiotherapy, narcotics, and rehab. Uh, now, the patient still complained of severe mid-back pain, which is really strange, and weakness of the uh, left ankle, uh, limitation of his daily activities, sleep disturbance. He had depression and suicidal thoughts because of the pain. In July 2017, he was admitted to Prince Sultan Humanitarian City in Riyadh for rehab, had extensive multidisciplinary rehabilitation program, improved his function, but the pain did not resolve. So in, in um, July 2018, he was reassessed at John Hopkins Aramco, and uh, they advised to undergo a trial of a spinal cord stimulator. Um, for him. Unfortunately, the trial was unsuccessful. It wasn't touching the mid-back. It touched the lower back where he had just mild pain uh, and some leg pain. Um, so they removed the uh, implant and they, they decided to put an intrathecal morphine pump for him, which gave him excellent pain relief, but unfortunately, had, he had... Um, uh, complications where he had severe urinary retention and difficult urination. So the um, pain physician decided to remove it. Uh, so now he's left with no, no options and um, the pain continued. So he was readmitted to Prince Sultan where they um, just did rehab for him and they give him pretty uh, heavy narcotics, oxycodone, fentanyl patches, uh, and drugs for depression and sleep. Now, I got involved with him in early um, March 2019 for where he approached me for a uh, second opinion. So at this time, uh, my options were limited with this patient. There was nothing to do. Um, this is a patient with, with, with severe pain and he's an opioid dependent. So um, my initial plan was to uh, get rid him uh, get, rid, get him rid of his opioid dependence. So I started him on uh, methadone and advised to start him uh, sessions of ketamine infusions. As you know, ketamine um, is an excellent drug for opioid dependence, neuropathic pain, and also for depression. So I gave him two cycles. Um, he comes uh, for a week, takes a cycle from Sunday to Thursday with increasing doses of ketamine IV under um, monitoring in the uh, post anesthesia care unit. Uh, it improved his depression, but it didn't. It it helped his pain for two to three weeks, but the pain ref, uh, referred back. So, and he comes keeps coming to me with, with this pain and he says, please do something. So the only option that I had at that time was to do a peripheral field stimulation for him um, with an, um, a spinal cord stimulator. And I'll show you the surgery now. The patient had the procedure, gave him good pain relief for four to six weeks, but then he started to lose the stimulation and the area of pain relief started to get um, lower and lower and now he follows up with me um, for uh, only to get his medication so this is what we did this is the area of the pain uh, he had two small incisions here and we introduced the uh, spinal cord stimulator uh, subcutaneously and i got it um, tunneled and fixed and then um, anchored and then we put the uh, IPG here. Um, so it was really an extensive surgery that took about four to five hours. So his current active problems are persistent mid-back pain, uh, previous extensive spinal fusion, opioid dependence, depression, and suicidal thoughts. Um, so just to summarize, this is a 35-year-old Saudi male, pretty young, uh, known to have uh, mild kyphoscoliosis, uh, had a road traffic accident, 
and an extensive thoracolumbar spinal fixation uh, with particular school schools and um, uh, persistent pain disability. He had the implant removed in Germany in 2017, had rehabilitation, nothing controlled his pain, became an opioid dependence with severe depression, uh, failed uh, spinal cord stimulator trial and failed uh, intrathecal pump implant because of the difficulty in urination. Um, so when I saw him in KFMC, as I said, opioid dependence management, get him an infusion peripheral field stimulation, and we're still still reaching nowhere with this patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Very interesting case. We have three minutes for questions. Uh, since we don't have any question from the audience, I would like to ask the uh, surgeon uh, on the panels to comment on this case. We'll start with Dr. Uh, Anwar, then we'll move to Dr. Basti. So, Dr. Anwar, what do you think, uh, in your opinion, happened with this case? Yeah, it's very interesting and very intriguing case, actually, because uh, we don't understand completely why he had all this kind of pain. But uh, uh, we can notice that the first surgery we don't understand really the indication and the construct that was done bypassing all that area of the fracture like a kind of uh, like if it was a kind of growing rod we don't understand so uh, it's it's a very difficult case honestly i don't know why he had all these pains and we can see that despite what was done he still ha he still has the the pain so uh, very very difficult case i think this the patient, Dr. Ali, had a CT scan at any point to see if he had non-union or? Uh, well, he had the CT scan done outside. I, I didn't put it in here. Uh, no, there was no, no uh, non-union. Actually, it was, it was, it was healing fine. Uh, it's, it's really puzzling why he's got this pain. At some stage, I, th I thought that this patient was malingering, actually. But, but no, when I... I even interviewed his family and 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 the family said that you know he, he's he, he really cries with this pain um which is really puzzling and there's there's no yeah any there is no reason why uh, all this pain and he's, he's on these heavy doses of narcotics and uh, he had all these uh, procedures done for him there's uh, two questions from the audience. One of them, they're saying that uh, he's asking if, uh, if uh, vertebroplasty can help uh, in this patient. What do you think, Dr. Basi? Dr. Basi? Anyone? Um, yeah, thank you. Actually, this is a challenging uh, case, especially the, the pain, I think uh, we call it the hidden uh, disease, uh, that you can't see the pathology, you know? Uh, vertebral plastic can help, uh, but not in all cases. And uh, when I consent my patient to do uh, vertebral or kyphoplasty, usually I consent them that uh, they might not improve. Actually, so far we don't we don't know uh, before the surgery if the kyphoplasty is really effective or not until we do the surgery. So uh, I think uh, the option uh, Dr. Ali he uh, he uh, proposed here and he did for the patient. Uh, I think it's uh, one of the solution. Uh, Vertebroplasty is another solution, yes, but uh, unfortunately with the spine, it's a try and error. So we don't have really a test that can show us that uh, which one is uh, more effective. Uh, we have patients, uh, we did surgery for them, uh, fixation. They came uh, with the pain even uh, at the upper level, above the level of the fusion. Uh, well, when you review the CD scan, as Ahmed he mentioned about the CD scan, uh, we do nerve conduction. There is nothing really uh, significant. We look at their social, socioeconomic. Uh, we use antidepressant, morphines. Uh, it doesn't work. So the only my points here, and uh, I think uh, the system it's uh, demanding. It takes uh, four, four to five hours. I think I, I think I just mentioned. Uh, it took it takes long time to uh, to apply. Uh, although uh, uh, as well, it is expensive uh, set. So not every patient can provide it especially when we talk about the private uh, sector as well. Uh, the insurance and even the patient, they, don't, they can't afford it. I think uh, it ranged from, um, as I remember, from uh, 15 to, uh, to 20, 24, 25,000 uh, the set. So uh, yes, it's, um, uh, I think a vertebral plus is another option. 
Dr. Ali, you mentioned he's a sick lab. He's a sickle cell disease no, uh, patient. No, he's not a sick lab. No, no, he's not a sick okay. lab. No, he's got G6PD. He's got G6PD, but that's not uh, uh, not relevant to the to, to his problem. Okay, because we're running out of time. Uh, any of the panelists wants to comment actually, on this case? Actually, just the last point. I think the the, the 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 only thing that I'm thinking of doing to him is to repeat the intrathecal pump, but not with morphine. Um, I'll try to use other drugs. Uh, probably use some local anesthetics with clonidine and try, maybe, um, this will relieve his pain, but I really doubt it because he's gone over this. Now, he comes every few months to take the ketamine infusion but because it helps his, his depression, actually. Okay, but he did not get any epidural injection, yes? He had, he had before. Abdullah Ramdi in, in Aramco gave him a few injections. Uh, it, it helped him before the surgery. Um, after the surgery, he had it once. It didn't help him. Okay. And no infection, of course. Infection was all out in his situation. No. no. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, we'll move to the next uh, case. Uh, we'll move to Dr. Samir Asayr. He uh, is a pediatric, and spine, uh, pediatric uh, orthopedic and pediatric spine consultant at the National Guard Hospital in Riyadh. Uh, he will present uh, a nice case uh, for us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We will talk about a, a complex uh, congenital scoliosis that has a uh, uh, The patient is a 16-month-old girl, product of full-term normal spontaneous vaginal delivery with no antenatal or postnatal complications and presented with a complaint of progressive back deformity noticed by the family. Uh, normal developmental milestone was noticed uh, with the child. Clinically, the patient is having a left thoracic curve with a trunk shift to the left, normal muscular, muscle power examination, Sensory assessment was very difficult as the child is small. Uh, normal symmetrical reflexes and no signs of hyperreflexia in the lower extremity or, or the upper extremity. Radiographs shows uh, co congenital scoliosis with a complex uh, type, uh, mixed type. There is a hemivertebras and bar formation. Also the rib in the right side of the thoracic uh, uh, was uh, fused. Uh, from these findings, uh, uh, it's a high chance of uh, progression and we started immediately with a further investigation of an MRI, the whole spine, CT scan of the spine and the thoracic uh, cage, echocardiograms and ultrasound of the abdomen to rule out cardiac and renal uh, uh, congenital anomalies associated. Uh, MRI was done under uh, general anesthesia and it shows the statomyelia of the cord uh, from T6 to L2 with a bony symptom, uh, symptom at the level of T9 to T11. And uh, also uh, the, the conus medullaris was low lying at the level of L4, L5. And you can see the image, the bony symptom and the two canal or the dura sac with the cord in it. Another images of the MRI, it shows the bony symptoms and also here in the uh, other images. CT scan, it shows the bony symptom here in the uh, 3D reconstruction and the coronal uh, section. ECHO uh, was normal and ultrasound, it shows only right kidney hydronephrosis grade one and uh, after all the investigation was done, another radiograph, which shows a progression of the deformity, uh, even the lung uh, volume in the right side start to be smaller than the left side. And the uh, patient during that uh, period has a recurrent admission due to schist infection and uh, complication from, uh, 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 from uh, bronchial asthma. So if we go back to the patient, the patient is having a progressive, documented progressive scoliosis, the congenital type, 
the statumai mili of the cord, tethered cord, and rib fusion uh, causing a smaller size uh, right uh, lung. So the operative plan was to, to do the surgery in two stages. The first stage by the neurosurgery, where they go for resection of the bony septum and repair of the dural sac and untethering of the cord at the level of L5S1. And you can see that two dura and where the septum was there and was uh, restricted uh, by the surgeon. After one week, uh, the second stage was planned for the impl implants uh, of the spine. Uh, we addressed the issue of the rib cage by doing a rib osteotomy and uh, insertion of a vector rib to rib uh, to expand uh, the right uh, hemithorax and interposition of muscle between the, uh, the ribs was uh, osteomatized uh, and this osteotomy was continued all the way to the bar uh, at the spine. Uh, then we inserted the uh, spinal uh, based uh, growing rods uh, to control uh, the trunk shift uh, and the scoliosis. Uh, the other solution was to put uh, a vector rib to spine uh, based uh, construct, but it was too bulky for this child. Uh, and uh, we decided to go as uh, spinal growing rod, a conventional type. Uh, this is the follow up after six months post operatively, as everything is maintained and stable. And this is after the first expansion of the growing rods and the vector, and the patient is still continuing in the follow-up in my clinic, and uh, the patient is still uh, uh, planned for the second expansion soon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Samir. Very interesting and challenging uh, case. Uh, uh, since thank you. Uh, the, I have only one uh, inquiry from the audience is the patient has a thoracic spinal bifida and he can see that from the 3D CT scan. Yeah. It's, a, it's a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, my, the question that it came to my mind, uh, but you already answered that, uh, why you did not do a rib to vertebra construct? You, uh, uh, because that will uh, reduce the amount of metals that you can put in this patient. You chose to use the vector to extract the ribs, and you also you choose to use a uh, growing construct uh, for the spine. So why you did not use the rib to vertebra construct? So uh, when you use the vector uh, for rib to spine, the screw size will be 6.35 uh, in, the, in the lumbar spine and they are bulky construct. We use the spinal uh, growing rods uh, 4.5 uh, system. The patient is uh, just two years old and it was uh, gonna be very bulky uh, construct for him. Okay, and uh, of course you uh, did use multimodality neural monitoring in this case. So any, any changes, any things happen? Non neural monitoring changes during the surgery, both stages, alhamdulillah. Okay. Mashallah, mashallah. And uh, uh, so far, alhamdulillah, no wound complication or uh, hardware prominence or... Uh, no. Okay. So far, and, uh, not without any, no complication, alhamdulillah, so far. And you did not consider to do uh, uh, pre-operative uh, halo uh, gravity traction? With the bars and uh, the bar formation, it, the, the, the scoliosis is, uh, deformity is too rigid. So uh, what we have done is uh, antether and release the spinal cord, give her a rest for a week, then we brought her for the osteotomies to do okay. acute correction, okay. of a gradual correction, because it's a rigid congenital scoliosis. It will not help. There's a question by someone says, at which age do you operate in case of congenital scoliosis? Which, sorry? At what age you would consider to operate on congenital scoliosis? All it depends on the progression of the deformity. If the deformity progressing, and like in this situation where the, there is a vertebra and contralateral bar, this is a high chance of progression and uh, 
uh, with other congenital anomalies of the spinal cord, this is push us to for early surgery. But other cases, we will follow the patients. If there is a progression of the deformity, we'll go for a, uh, uh, and our cup angle measurement may be around 40 to 50 degrees for our yeah. surgical intervention. Uh, usually, I try to push them uh, up to the That's age of four, but sometimes you have to operate sooner, like the, this case. But uh, most of the time, I'd like to delay them at the age of four years. Any comment, Dr. Anwar, about that? What age you usually open? Or Dr. Bashar, uh, uh, since you guys do lots of congenital scoliosis, at what age? If there is a certain age that uh, you prefer to operate on. Uh, I completely agree with uh, with Samir. Uh, as as soon as we can put some screws, so after the age of uh, eighteen months or two years, if the ankylation is really above uh, thirty five or forty, and it has big chances of increasing, I would go for surgery. But of course, it's a it's a very very challenging and complex case. I always say for the congenital sclerosis, there is no guide, uh, clear, clear guidelines or like the AIS, we have the linking classification and we go by, uh, like we can easily uh, plan our surgery. And congenital sclerosis, I, I always say each case is unique and each case has to has its own uh, plan. And sometimes you have to be uh, very creative and think out of the box. Dr. Bashar, any thoughts about this case? Yeah, this is a very nice case and well done. Uh, usually, whenever I plan to put like destructive uh, instruments like uh, growing rods or so, I would like to, to have the patient more than five years old if possible to avoid uh, this growing problem mm -hmm. with, the, uh, with the growing rods, if possible, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Samir, there's a question that says that uh, 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 we, uh, we did not see a full spinal correction uh, even after six months. Is there another operation schedule when the patient grows up? Well, uh, the growing road system is mainly is to stop progression of the deformity. Yes, in the first stage will our aim is to get correction as much as possible but the main uh, ad, ad, uh, reason of the growing roads insertion is the control of the progression of the deformity your first aim stopping the progression of the deformity uh, so i'm not expecting to get uh, any cor further correction of the spine as long as I will keep it the same, I'm, I, 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 I win the battle of this uh, difficult, complex uh, case. Yeah, I completely agree, Dr. Samir. Uh, one last question, uh, why you did not use, uh, why you didn't consider a magnetic rod for this patient? Uh, the patient, the, the vector is gonna have an expansion every six months. So putting a magic rod, it doesn't make sense as the patient will come under general anesthesia for the vector expansion. So that's why I put a conventional growing rod of the spine uh, as the patient is coming for an expansion anyway for the vector. Okay. So uh, thank you, Dr. Samir. It was a very interesting case. Uh, we'll move for our uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Anwar. Uh, Dr. Anwar, he's a spine uh, consultant at uh, Al Kingdom Hospital, Al Mamlaka Hospital in Riyadh. He will present to us a very nice uh, case as well. Thank you, Ahmad. Assalamu alaikum. So, uh, you see my full screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, it's another congenital uh, uh, case, but uh, I think it's more straightforward than the one of Samir. It's, uh, it's much simpler. Uh, I wanted to share it with you just to show you the, the evolution, the natural evolution challenge and uh, uh, interesting features of uh, some regular, uh, let's say, congenital cases. 
sorry. So it's a four year old uh, boy with a treacher Collins syndrome. Um, he had a normal birth with a normal walking, but some dysmorphic features were uh, early noticed. He was operated uh, for a cleft lip uh, and palate at the age of nine months, uh, also for the testis at the age of two years. In, a, in addition to all of that, he had uh, blood disease, uh, what is called thalassemia media. So he has frequent transfusions uh, every two months because he has very, very low hemoglobin levels that may drop down to six. Uh, in addition also to that, a scoliosis was discovered at the age of two. I showed, uh, I saw actually the reports. I, I couldn't have the, the pictures, but the previous cob was uh, around 35 degrees and was treated with a brace. And he had a normal neurological exam. So uh, this is his X-ray. So as you can see, he has a double major scoliosis. We can notice here that also he has coxa valga bilaterally. Uh, so it's a double major scoliosis with angulations between 40 and 50 degrees uh, between thoracic and lumbar. Uh, he has a pelvic incidence of 60 degrees. I think this is important to see for the sagittal balance because it means that uh, he is supposed to have a little bit big curves uh, at the area of the lumbar and thoracic spine. The measures thoracic spine, uh, thoracic kyphosis here is 65. So I think uh, compared to his pelvic incidence, it's, it's important. It shouldn't be uh, above 55. So, uh, uh, so uh, double major scoliosis at an early age uh, when we see his CT scan, uh, we can notice some congenital anomalies and mainly this uh, non-segmented T9 hemivertebra on the right side that is actually causing the main thoracic uh, curve uh, and uh, the compensatory lumbar curve below. We can notice that below the hemivertebra, we have a spina bifida at the, at the level of T10 and also at the sacral area. Uh, this is uh, the, the CT scan. You see here the completely non-segmented T9 hemivertebra on the cor coronal view and on the sagittal view. MRI did not show any cord anomalies. Dr. Anwar, can you press to get on to mo uh, presentation mode, please? Sorry? Can you put it on presentation mode so the picture will be bigger? Oh, sorry. Okay. Better? Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is the CT scan and the MRI. And so uh, regarding uh, the actual situation, what would be the management options? Uh, it's either to continue the conservative management until an older age or to go with the, the hemivertebral resection and do a short construct. Uh, eventually, we can combine hemivertebral resection with a, a kind of growing system or to go only with a growing system. So uh, uh, my decision actually was uh, to go for surgical management uh, because of uh, the evolution of the scoliosis uh, between the age of two and four uh, and uh, because it's a non-segmented hemivertebra that is going to evolve. Uh, and as we mentioned before with Dr. Samir, we can operate an, at an early age. So uh, I went with the second option of hemivertebral resection and doing a short construct. So I will just share with you the intraoperative images. Uh, so uh, I did uh, two levels above and two levels below a fixation uh, because uh, sometimes when we uh, do the hemivertebral resection and we do just one level above and below, if the gap is important, we, we may have a failure of the screw, especially when there is a kyphosis. If there is a kyphosis, the load is going to be important. So it's better to reinforce the screw with an, another level. Uh, here, the, you can see uh, the spatula underneath the ninth rib because we will need to resect the, the, uh, the hemivertebra. So it's like a vertebral column resection on one side. So we need to remove part of the rib like two or three centimeters. Uh, this picture actually is just to, to show you the, the, the size of my thumb and fingers 
compared to the field. So uh, it's a very small field. Uh, so you need to be really very uh, gentle and smooth while you are doing this kind of surgery. This is after uh, the hemivertebral uh, hemi resection. Here is the exit route that goes below T9. And here also you can see the size of the field because uh, compression devices are almost the size of the field. And so in this case, uh, to avoid having overload on the screws, I, I did the compression on one side uh, with two compression devices. So above and below here, and also above and below with a bigger compression device. Sometimes we can use a domino or a connector, but uh, of course at this age, it's, it's very, very small. So this is the, the, the final uh, reduction here, uh, when you can see that the screws above and below are really close to each other. We, we could uh, close the gap. And at the end, I cover usually the defect uh, with a gel foam uh, before putting the graft on, on the whole area. And so uh, this is the immediate post-op X-ray. Of course, I, I, I did a cast for this kit to be worn for uh, uh, about three months, uh, especially to protect uh, uh, from the compensatory curve because we know that the compensatory curve may be dangerous sometimes. So I was really happy with this finding. And as you can see, the angulations decreased to 18 degrees and 23 degrees. And even uh, the kyphosis decreased uh, to 50 degrees. So I saw the patient after three months. Uh, sorry, this is the post-op CT scan. Yeah, I forgot to say that uh, I did some. I put some bone graft from the back uh, inside the, the defect from the heavy vertebra to to increase the chances of bone healing. Okay, I put the the the, the, the graft uh, from the right side, as you can see it here on the CT scan with a bridge here. So. I saw him again at three months. And so at three months, uh, you see how there is again an increase in the curves. So uh, when I measured them, uh, they increased to 26 to 28 degrees uh, between the thoracic and lumbar. It's not, of course, the pre-op measures, but still they increased. And regarding the sagittal balance, uh, it's very similar to what it was before. So. Uh, uh, I wanted to show you this finding because uh, it shows the uh, how it's unpredictable, the evolution in, in congenital scoliosis cases. And it's not always as satisfying as adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, unfortunately. So uh, this is the X-ray at 18 months. So after one and a half year, you see it's globally stable compared to the three month with angulations that are around 29 or 30 degrees, to be honest. Sagittal balance is still the same. Patient is not complaining. Uh, he's living a normal life. Uh, but you see, we had like maybe 50 or 45% of correction. So uh, this is the comparison between the pre-op and the last follow-up. Uh, you can notice eventually that the coronal, the coronal alignment uh, eventually improved because the C7 plus 9 is more centered on the on the last follow up uh, X ray, uh, and uh, I wanted to share with you this paper from Madrid uh, that was published last year in the Spine Deformity Journal, where they say regarding the hemivertebral resection below the age of five years that you may have a good initial correct correction, but uh, usually it's around fifty percent at the final follow up. So don't expect to have very big correction that will be maintained at the long run in congenital uh, cases. Uh, the compensatory curve uh, also uh, partially corrected and even it was at 25% at the final follow-up and coronal balance worsened at the final follow-up compared to the preoperative uh, coronal balance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. One was very interesting case. Uh, I, I do have a similar case that uh, initial X-ray after surgery was excellent. Then I'm following her, and I, I see a little bit of uh, care progression. And I totally, uh, you mentioned one point, uh, which is very good point that I usually always is prefer to cast those patients after surgery. So uh, kids, once their pain is uh, disappeared, they will jump jump all around and they may 
uh, dislodge the constructs, so casting them uh, at this part, uh, uh, at this stage is very important. Um, Dr. Sure. Samir, uh, can you comment on this case? Do you have any questions? Uh, we can see that it was documented progression. This is the point. And after the surgery, uh, there was an, an, a uh, correction of the deformity. Yes, there was a little bit slightly loss of the correction in the beginning, but it been maintained. This is our aim of the surgery, is to prevent the progression of the deformity in congenital scoliosis. This is our aim always, not fully corrected. Uh, but uh, I was uh, gonna ask about the, in the lateral view, the roads are a little bit straight. Why we didn't maintain it a little bit in Kaifos, Dr. Anu? Regarding the, uh, the, the sagittal? Sagittal. The roads are a little bit straight roads, not bended in the Kaifos in the, that area. You, yeah, because you actually uh, I was eager uh, in the surgery to correct the initial kyphosis. Yeah. So I wanted to uh, try to correct it because I felt it was important. But uh, unfortunately, uh, even with the correction, initial correction, he created kyphosis all around the, the, the operated area because it seems that his balance requires that. Yeah, he's happy with that, his previous kyphosis. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. He will remain like this. Yeah. Good job. There's a question about why you did not use a glowing load construct. Uh, it's a very good question. Because uh, I felt that I may have a good chance of reaching a correction. Because you, you saw how, how he is. It's a complicated kid. He had many surgeries. He has transfusions every two weeks. So he's always in the hospital. Uh, I felt that I may reach uh, an acceptable result by doing a short fusion a single time and eventually if something goes wrong later on to put a growing system because otherwise he will go uh, to, to, uh, to have a lot of surgeries in the next five years. Yeah, I think and even the, if you look at the stunt time with the, with the congenital scoliosis, usually the curve is a small and sharp. It's not like a big... Uh, uh, curve like the one we see usually in AIS. If you think that you can just correct the, most of the time if you take the heavy vertebra, that curve get corrected so you don't need for the long uh, fusion or long construct. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, someone was asking uh, about uh, the role of anterior release in both cases. I honestly almost stop anterior release because we can do a lot of things from the back unless it's really extremely complicated. Okay. Uh, there's so many questions. I'm trying to find the, the more, most interesting one. Uh, of course, we you answered that uh, about the, if uh, you will not consider a magic rod for this case because it doesn't need the long fusion or a growing rod construct. Yes, yeah, yeah. The aim was to do like the classical hemivertebral resection, but at a very young age, and to do as short construct as possible. I have a I have a question. What technique that you use for the resection? How do you uh, resect that hemivertebral? There's so many techniques. So which one do you use? It's like if I'm doing a, a pedicle subtraction osteotomy on one side. I remove the rib. I open the foramen above and below. Uh, after that, I remove the posterior arch. And I, uh, with the small, very small osteotome, I start to remove in a wedge fashion the vertebral body. And after that, the disc above and below and the posterior wall by pushing it anteriorly. Uh, yeah. And I try, as I have showed on the CT, to put the graft inside and to close it on the graft. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there's other technique, uh, which is the eggshell technique. Uh, 
uh, usually I go with it because I think it's, for me, I think it's uh, much easier. Uh, and the egg shell technique, as everybody knows that, it's uh, as you're putting a pedicle screw in the pedicle of, in, uh, in that hemivertebra, then you just uh, squeeze or uh, take all the bone, cancellous bone out, then uh, until the edges stays. And after that, if you do a compression, that uh, hemivertebra will collapse because you're, the, the idea of actual technique is to make the, that hemivertebra weak so you can compress. That's another way to do it. Yeah, true. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll uh, move for the next uh, case, Dr. Bashar. Uh, he's a spine uh, consultant at uh, King Fahad Medical City in Dammam. He will present to us a nice uh, uh, AIS uh, case, Dr. Bashar. Thank you, Dr. Anwar. Hello? 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 Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Ahmed for the invitation, and it's an honor to me to it's, it's an honor uh, to me today to be with you guys. Do you hear me? Yes, but can you move your uh, can you share your screen? Yeah, it's not sharing. Sorry. I'm pressing sharing, it's not sharing. Do you see now? Yes. Can you, yes. It's better now? Yes. Okay. So um, my case today is a very simple case, but hopefully it's, at the end uh, we'll learn something from it. So this is like 15 year old girl with the typical uh, AIS case. This is an everyday case. You will see you will see this kind of cases every day in the clinics. So uh, with the uh, thoracic curve of 74 degrees and proximal curve 40 degrees and lumbar curve of 45 degrees. Um, with the mod modifier type B. So um, on the bending views, uh, it looks to be not quite flexible. It's like a triple, a triple major curve. So, so usually for this kind of cases, the difficulty is where to stop down. What's your lowest instrumented vertebra? So, whether you stop, uh, you you do selective fusion or you you, you fuse the lumbar spine. So I don't know, uh, Dr. Ahmed, where do you stop? Do you do selective on these cases or you, you fuse the lumbar spine? Uh, I'll go with the last touch vertebra with the central vertical uh, sacral line. So I will here in this one, uh, I will stop at L5432. Uh, L2 or L1, yeah, this is L1 here. Yeah. This is L1. I never stop at junctional, even if I'm doing, uh, if even if I'm going to do a selective thoracic, I don't like to s stop at junctional like T12. Mm -hmm. But at this case, I think I will stop at. Uh, wow, let's. Uh, can I see the bending again? I think two is reasonable, uh, but although three, it can be because there is a lots of rotation in three. Uh, let's ask Dr. Basi, Dr. Samir, and the rest. One, two, three. Yeah, one, two, three. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Basi, Dr. Samir, what do you think? Where we can, where, where you will stop? Um, can, can we see the lateral bending views? Oh. I'll stop at three. There is a good rotation in three. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think I agree with you. I think uh, three is uh, would, would be enough. So uh, mm -hmm. I think it's better to preserve the. But is it the three uh, above the curve, the apex of the lumbar side? Sorry. Can yeah. you go back with the previous? Uh... Yes. Okay. Uh, 
yeah, it's. Uh, I think uh, I, I would go with three. Three, I think it's uh, it's very good. Uh, there's uh, one of the theories also. Uh, Dubi he, he mentioned that uh, any uh, disc that uh, mobilize, even if there is about five to thirty degrees, uh, uh, the average uh, with the lateral bending views, uh, usually he doesn't involve them in the fusion. So uh, two, uh, I think it will. Uh, uh, it will cause some uh, shifting of the mid cycle line uh, to the to the left side. Sorry, to the right side. Uh, I would go with three. Three is more uh, stable here. What do you think, Dr. Samir? Uh, the lumbar curve is it flexible? Uh, it's, sure. it's, it's, it's linking four. It means it's uh, rigid, right? Yeah, it's, it's uh, thirty degrees. 30 degrees in the bending. So yes. we have to include the lumbar curve. So L3 is an, a good option, I think. It's a touch vertebra. Stopping at L2 is not a good option because the apex is the disc between L2 and L3. So you have to go below L3 or L4. Dr. Salah? Yeah, I will go for L3 also. Okay. Oh, perfect. So. Uh, so as I, as you said, guys, it's a little bit debatable where to stop. So whether L1 or L3, L4. Uh, I plan to stop at L1, in fact. So and this is the immediate post-op X-ray. You can see that, yeah, immediately it's like the patient is a little bit off balance and shifted, huh? shifted to the left side. So. I told the family that it's expected immediately to have something like this. Hopefully, it's going to improve in six months, as usually six months. So I repeated the x-ray after the three months. It's getting worse. You see, there's like a wedging at the L2, L3 area here. There's like curve, about 30 degrees curve here. And still, we have this shift. So at this stage, uh, anybody will do anything or wait? Or what's, what's, what do you what do you do? What do you do, guys, at this stage? I will wait. Six we'll months. Six, six months. Month. Three months. Three months. I'll wait. Definitely, I will wait. Okay. We, we repeated the X-ray after six months. Uh, it's uh, still the same, or maybe even worse. You see, it's the patient is off balance and um, shifted to the left. So. The, 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 the kid is not really happy with her shape. She, she, she feels that she was even more balanced before the surgery. So what do you do at this stage? Because the issue because you partially fused the lumbar curve. So either you was going to stop at T12, ignore the lumbar curve completely, and undercorrect the thoracic curve. So it will be compensating each other, the remaining of the, uh, the, uh, of the curves. Or you have to include passing the apex of the lumbar curve, which is L3. You have to go to instrument until L3. So what do you do at this, uh, this time? Uh, we, you have to extend the fusion, unfortunately, to L3 now, a second stage. What do you do, Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Mahdi? Well, I, I will wait as much as I can and look at the patient's symptoms. But uh, if, the, if the balance is getting worse, definitely I will extend my fusion. Uh, Actually, it depends also about the patient, uh, about the hyperlaxity. If the patient hyperlaxity from the beginning, uh, some of the recommendation that uh, we, yeah, we have to go... Yeah, she's not parfanoid like like syndrome. Yeah, parfanoid like, and uh, that's uh, one of the issues. But I would go with Ahmed. Uh, usually, I wait up to one year and uh, send her for physiotherapy, uh, exercise, increase the core strengthening muscles. This uh, I had one patient similar to this situation after uh, physical therapy, uh, but it's a it's a course, a big course. Uh, she improved actually. Uh, chiropractor plus minus it can help. Uh, but uh, I always, whenever I go with selective, a selective procedure in this situation, I always explain to the family that I might go back again and uh, fuse down to uh, uh, L4 or L5. Sure. What do you think? Uh, well, I think uh, I will uh, wait. I have a, a case like this. 
uh, usually after after one year i think uh, there is some uh, maybe not like improvement uh, much uh, radiologically but clinically or the satisfaction of the patient so i will just try to push the time but if i need it so i will go like what dr samir he said i will go and revise the case to l3 or l4 so um, I put her in a brace, in fact, trying to buy some time. But, you know, I waited another six months, and this is the X-ray at nine months without any improvement. It's unchanged. It's yeah. unchanged. Yeah. Little bit, she's a little bit balanced, but she's still very shifted to the, to the left side, as you can see here. So I discussed with the family if, if we, can, we can wait another one year and see what's going to happen. They, they agreed, so I waited, uh, this is at uh, 18 months here, she's, she's better, she's definitely she's better, and the shift is a little bit better. At two years, she's much better, you could see that there's a shift and, and coronal of balance is much better. So, and even the, the, the curb of the lumbar curve is, has decreased. From 30 degrees to to 14 degrees here, and uh, you could see at three years she's even better. She's she's getting better. You see now she's she's perfectly balanced and the, the shift is much better. So uh, as you could see, this is an pre and this is after three years. The patient is very happy now. So hopefully we are able to save her lumbar spine. So the year here the, the lesson that and you have to wait like three years to get, to, to get the, the final result here. So the, I was uh, at six months. I was not expecting that she will improve that because she's getting worse. But with time, she she improved. So the question here now. So then is, is there any any way to do like multi center study for this modifier B and C? and study our cases and present them, at, for example, at the SRS or whatever you see, guys. So if we can oh, look at cases from all Saudi Arabia, from Jeddah, from Riyadh, from everywhere, and do like multi-center study, selective versus non-selective, and see if we get like 200, 300 cases and study them with the like three to five years follow-up. I think uh, as we were talking that all of us has uh, such cases and it's a great idea for a multi-center study and I always uh, tell uh, the resident those uh, the resident that those uh, young patient they always surprise you so always uh, if the parent uh, understand and uh, patient is doing fine always uh, go with uh, conservative and wait until to the point that uh, you have to go for surgery because such uh, things can happen in, in a pediatric uh, age uh, group. Uh, one of the questions was uh, asked that if there is any uh, waste asymmetry during all uh, clinically? Yeah, the, the waste uh, symmetry, this is like uh, on the x ray, it's like the tranquil ship. It's, it's improving over time, as you can see here. They say waste asymmetry is much better here. By the way, I, I, I consulted Larry Linky on this case. On this case, he thinks that I should go back and operate on her at, at, at nine months. But this is just to, to see that that this is a difficult difficult topic, and nobody can give you the correct answer. That's why I'm asking for multi-center study to, to have something like study on that. Uh, someone uh, like uh, we when you asked us where we will stop and most of us said L3 so why did you stop at L1 did I miss that why I, I stopped at L1 because L1 is the is the if you want to do selective either you stop at L1 or L, L, uh, at L1 or D12 like yes. so that's okay. why I stopped at L1 yeah, you can see that here the, the, the stable vertebra is, is, is L1. That's why I picked that one. Uh, but we know that, 
from the discussion that the lumbar cap was a rigid cap and the bending from the, the lumbar cap went down to 30 so that means it's a rigid curve and even the x-ray shows lots of rotation so why you still wanted to go with a selective fusion in this case uh, i got your i got your question so uh, remember that in 1993 larry dinky and keith O'Brien they, they published about selective fusion criteria if you have cob over cob more than 1.2 rotation over rotation more than 1.2 and translation over translation 1.2 1, 1. to do selective even if this is like rigid you know this is the idea of selective and even i have i had the case uh, where they it's lumbar c and it's rigid and even i stopped uh, at l1 and they talk so but this is was more difficult than the modifier c i was expecting that to be much more difficult. So uh, for this, this is the idea of selective fusion. So it's not whether it's structural or not structural. Ideally, you have to, 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 to fuse all the structural curve. But in fact, if you could save the lumber, the lumber curve, it will be much better, like in this case, even if it's structural, but with time it will correct. Because the, 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 the thoracic curve is much bigger than the lumbar curve. This, this is the trick here in, in this case. Okay. So hopefully, if you correct that the thoracic curve, you you could save the number. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bashar. It was a very interesting case. Uh, because of time, we have to move to the next speaker, Dr. Salah Adin Khalifa. Uh, because we want to keep Dr. Basti to the end because he has a very interesting case. And for the audience, I'm trying to answer most of your questions by typing. And uh, uh, some of the questions that you're asking is being answered by the speaker as he's presenting. So uh, excuse me if I couldn't answer uh, all the questions, but I'm trying my best. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Is my voice clear for everyone? Clear and loud. Wow. Okay. Okay. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, uh, first of all, kul am kul khair lil jamia wa nasal Allah an yarfa al waba wal bala. I will just uh, go to this case. Uh, Interesting case. She's a 14-year-old female patient presented to my clinic with a picture of uh, Marfan syndrome. She's having back deformity progressed very quickly over the last year. Uh, she was uh, um, traveling with her family from one city to another till landed to my clinic. So she's having this picture. Uh, without going in further detail, I would like to have uh, some opinion from a lot of seniors in the group I can see. Uh, so there is a vote. So Mr. Bilal, if you may put the vote, please. For this case, if you have this case and you want to tackle this patient surgically or non-surgically, whatever. So can you go with the uh, with the with those options? Uh, number one is like non-operative treatment since it's almost rigid and won't progress. Traction for six weeks, then posterior. First stage anterior release, then second stage posterior release, then uh, um, surgery all from posterior. So we'll just have like 30 seconds or 20 seconds to have some uh, of the expert here. I will add interoperative traction, uh, Dr. Salah. I would do that. Yeah, okay. So this is what I, yeah, just not to complicate things for the people. So list options, let's say. Uh, so 10 seconds more, then we'll go for. Okay, Mr. Bilal. <laughs> if we may see the results. Oh, interesting. So in an operate operative, we have like six percent, twenty-four percent with six weeks, thirty-six percent anterior than posterior. Interesting. Uh, and uh, surgery from posterior is 35. So 
it's really challenging with the <laughs> many. What did they choose? The panel, Dr. Mahdi, Dr. Samir, Dr. Bashar, Dr. Anwar. Yes. I would, I would go. Uh, yes, uh, actually, it's uh, two two schools. Yes, I, I would. Uh, I would love to go anterior than posterior. Uh, uh, I would do uh, aggressive release from the anterior, and I think it is uh, really uh, effective. I have um, a few cases similar. Uh, I go with selective thoracotomy there. Um, I'm using actually uh, the the ACDF uh, cages, the big cage of the, for the cervical. I go here yeah. with the abex area, do release, and put the cage, uh, mm -hmm. reduce the, the curve, and uh, plus minus traction, and then uh, once the patient reach uh, mm -hmm. uh, the suitable mm -hmm. age, then we'll we go with the We'll go on to the Dr. Samir, what do you do? Uh, I'll go for preoperative traction and okay. assess uh, the deformity correction, then we'll decide either if it's too rigid, there is no correction with the preoperative traction, then we have to go for anterior. But if there is a correction and acceptable, then I will go with an interoperative traction with posterior only uh, correction. Uh, probably all posterior. Okay, Dr. Bashar? Yeah, yeah. for me, I, I don't do any traction for these cases, even a pre-op or intra-op. I do only, I do like uh, 10 ponte osteotomy. Probably you, he will lose the signal. So he could stage it. So, and then do it for one time. Sometimes it works. Uh, even I get cases like 150 degrees uh, and it works like this. Um, interesting uh, answers, uh, Sarah. I will okay, go with yeah. the interoperative traction and posterior only. Okay, go ahead, Sarah. Okay, so Sorry. I think, uh, I think the, uh, the uh, varieties of the uh, um, answers uh, that reflect how much complicated sometimes the scoliosis and the the panel discussion is really great. So uh, I will come back to this picture, uh, but la just let me go. So those were the option. So let me just take you through the, uh, the, the, uh, the steps or the journey of this case from preoperative, how to choose your instruments, anesthesia, position, facetectomy, medical screws, osteotomies, and so on. First of all, this case is Marfan syndrome. Uh, it's one type of the, let's say, syndromatic or muscular problem connected tissue. So we have many, many options and many, many classifications for the scoliosis. Uh, uh, there is a nice article about the only spine deformities in Marfan syndrome and uh, summarize many, many problems. And uh, it's like clinical uh, diagnosis more than sometimes genetics. Uh, so you'll send the patient for genetics or pediatric, but like very important is to, to, to have like a, a very good preoperative plan. Uh, and to diagnose the cases because really those cases, if, if, if go wrong in the surgery, might the patient will lose his life because of the cardiac issues, aortic dissection, and the bleeding, the, the mortality rate, and stuff like that. So first of all, you need to diagnose it as Marfan syndrome. What's the good maybe in those cases is, is the elasticity. So elasticity might will help you in your reduction. Uh, some preoperative planning is the is the is the um, MRI for sure for those cases to see any anomalies or uh, spinal cord problems. And uh, you can see here in this uh, cut uh, the the disc is not rigid, so there is some flexibility. Or might you you'll have some uh, reduction because of the of the disc here. Uh, otherwise, it was uh, insignificant. So preoperative like uh, cervical equis very important and the preoperative uh, work plan, I will not go in details for that. So back in my old days in the fellowship, uh, preoperative for the scoliosis cases, there is a lot of puzzles you need to connect, like the upper end vertebral, the lower end vertebral, structural curve, non-structural curve, the skin, the neurological uh, manifestation, flexibility, surgical profile. So you need to gather all of those information. This is the, 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 will add more complexity for your decisions. So back to this case again. So this case is like around 105, 105 degrees. If you do some bending, it will come back to 78. So there is some hope. It's like uh, 15 degree or uh, 20 degree, let's say. The lumbar curve were, was very promising. So in this case here, at least to L4, there is some rotations, but if you do some bending, it's going to go, come back. So I selected 
uh, my uh, to stop between L4 or L5. So one of the, of the manifestations for the Marfan syndrome, they have sometimes spondylolisthesis, sacralization, and uh, stuff like that. So you need to study that very well. And I decided to go all from posterior without traction. So it was really uh, like what Dr. Bashar said, I will go for conti, osteotomy, and stuff like that. So I took the decision and we prepared the case. So this is like some preoperative. And you can see here, although she's having like a massive hump there, but it is not like uh, there is some flexibility with, with that, especially in this picture here, maybe it is not like the ugly hump you can see it with the 110 or 120 in cerebral palsy or other cases. So some strategy, 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 uh, strategic planning for the patient. So for example, this traction table, if you see here, the uh, usually we are 90 degree, but because of the flexibility, I just push the hand up. I always expose the neck here, so I uh, to have like space for going up and uh, and then the scrapping, and also uh, neuro monitoring is always there. Uh, some preoperative planning here and there. Here is a very important step, and I think this helped me a lot in the uh, the facetectomy. So always I'm, I'm keeping asking my my uh, trainees and the uh, residents why we are doing facetectomy. So facetectomy is if I just gather some information, it will increase your flexibility, more coronal and sagittal correction, compression of the convex curve, less pull out of the screws, increase the surface area for fusion, and you have autographed, identify the pedicle screw landmarks also, although you have the navigations. So enhance the fusion, and it's like step number one for quantity if needed. So if you do like very good facetectomy, this will help you a lot. But the, the downgrade for that is the increase of the bleeding of this. The, the navigated high-speed drill, it's like a game changer for me. So I will show you some video here. If you have like very small, small, small pedicles, and you will go with this, it's really, if you, you can go with the navigations, with the, with the, with the, with the miter slicks or with the, with the speed drill, and then it will make your life very easy and very safe, and you will go there inside, and uh, even in the very narrow, narrow slit pedicle sometimes, you can, maybe this one is not like the most narrowest in the surgery, but just to, to demonstrate that, you go the midas up to the vertebra, vertebra. And always you have like a posterior here, uh, like a closure or something. So if you go with the midas or with the, with the speed drill, it will help you a lot. And I did not use to do with this without navigation before. So it was always with the, uh, pedicle finder. So this is like a very strategic. If you have navigation, try to utilize this uh, important tool, especially, especially in those cases. Uh, then I went for Ponty, but it was not like 10 uh, levels like Dr. Uh, Bashar uh, recommended. It was like three or four levels, not too much. And always what this is in my belief it, in Ponty, it's not necessarily to remove everything. The ligamentum flavum is very important here. So if you remove the ligamentum flavum, even even this part of the superior articular process, sometimes if you leave it because it's super flexible here and you are all already just plugged the vertebra. So, uh, but I think the ligamentum flavum, flavum is very rigid here. So if you manage to remove the ligamentum flavum and the neuro monitoring and, uh, and luckily I did not have any uh, signal lost in this uh, in this uh, step. So I think this is from another case, but it's something similar to this one. Uh, then you'll start your reduction. So always with those cases, you need like two rods at the same time. I think this is one of the best thing. Uh, this article is very, very nice. And this picture I printed for my trainees, a resident in the OR, so it's in front of me. Whenever I'm trying, starting to contour my rods, just I'm looking to this one and we are contouring according to this one, as everyone knows. Uh, hyper um, kyphotic in the uh, concave side and hypo in the uh, convex side and so on. And uh, this article, I recommend everyone who's dealing with scoliosis to go back, Faldini, he did it like 2018 or something. And what he's trying to push the from the concave side and uh, restoring the apical kyphotic and uh, this article, so try planar correction. So he's playing with all the uh, the, uh, the 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 steps of the correction. 
from vertebral derotation. So what I'm doing is like this, my workflow in the correction, and I recommend everyone just to go and relax in this step, don't rush and correct it quickly because you are spending a long time to put extant pedicle screw. And now in this step and the decortication step, always uh, some of the surgeons, they are in hurry. So I think we need to have our time. So contour the rods, if both rods, they, this is excellent. Then rod placement, rod derotation, but don't lock, uh, don't kiss the rod. He's saying kissing the rod. So no kissing of the rod, just loosely, the proximal and distal end, just try to reduce it loosely. Then you start playing with the apical vertebral derotation uh, and consequential reduction. Sometimes even I'm not doing full turn, I'm doing uh, like half turn, sometimes quarter turn. So because if one screw pulled out, you will be in a bit, uh, a bit longer the surgery because you need to go back and put the bigger screw and uh, don't lose your pedicle channel that you did there. Then before you tighten fully, do the compression destruction. So you will do three, four steps in the same time with your assistant. And after that, you will have good. Uh, in the AO Spine Member Plus, there is a lot of webinars and uh, Dr. Olet, he's describing this in one of the videos. So this is also, I recommend you, since we have time now to go and review, especially the people who is interested in the deformities. Irrigation, this is maybe uh, inspiration of Dr. Turkistani. So always those cases, you need to do a lot of irrigation uh, post-op or post the reduction. So sometimes I'm reaching like up to 10 liters uh, with uh, irrigation, a lot, a lot of irrigation. Uh, and at the end, this is the picture. So I'm always keeping the spinous process. Maybe only the ponty places here that removed, but always I'm keeping the ponty. I'm putting a lot of synthetic bone graft, especially the syndromatic or the cerebral palsy cases, and uh, mix it with vancomycin powder. So maybe there is argument with the vancomycin powder, but I'm super selective with the vancomycin powder. And this is a meta-analysis, and it's concluded that uh, may not increase the rates of gram-negative or polymicrobial spinal infection, but can significantly reduce the infection rate of gram-positive bacteria. And this is the target in those cases, because if they pass the complication intraoperative with the bleeding, and inshallah, no more mortality with them, you don't want to go in the uh, infection uh, problems postoperatively. So luckily this case was managed very well, uh, alhamdulillah, and this is uh, the correction. So if this is the picture immediately post-operatively. If you can see the shoulder is a bit down here. So maybe I like was aggressive with the correction, but like I waited for six months and this was the last X-ray for her. Uh, six months and there was no complication. The lung was opened and the patient was really super satisfied. And it's in, I remember in that last visit, she, she, uh, she, asked, she asked me if she may join the medical college. I told her, yeah, of course you can may, uh, join the medical college, but don't join the spinal surgery, please. So uh, this is the X-ray. Uh, she had bitter kyphosis, I may, I may say, preoperatively, maybe she's now a bit flat here in the kyphosis. Hopefully she will uh, continue like this. And uh, this is the case. So in conclusion, syndromatic case, you need to go for preoperative plan, a lot of preoperative plan, and don't, ignore any other problems, especially the aortic dissection in the Marfan syndrome. Uh, Preoperative elasticity play, played a lot of, uh, I was lucky with the elasticity she's having. Uh, all from posterior, uh, uh, although I, I agree with the traction, but I don't have the setup for traction, unfortunately. Uh, minor details, so uh, back to these puzzles here, a lot of details in scoliosis surgery, and uh, many mentors, when I was uh, trained, they told me, to be successful in uh, scoliosis or deformity surgery, you need to concentrate on the minor details and the fine details of the, uh, to achieve the great uh, results, inshallah. Uh, I know okay. many, of you, many of you have a lot of questions. Uh, they, I love to have them in my uh, Instagram, Scoliosis Saudi Arabia, and we can discuss a lot of opinions, a lot of x-rays, a lot of things. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you. We'll move to Dr. Basi since we are running out of time. Thank you, Dr. Salah. Dr. Basi, we all are yours now. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, and thank you for uh, letting me share uh, this uh, amazing uh, uh, event. Uh, this is a very uh, nice uh, case. I had it before, and there is many lessons that we, we learn from uh, similar cases. And uh, the most important thing is uh, just... Uh, to uh, to see uh, where uh, I went through and uh, just to do or not to do. Uh, 
uh, in future. So this is a 44 years old uh, male. Who, this guy, he's a very intelligent uh, person. He came from Taif uh, on a wheelchair. Uh, uh, to me, he's, uh, he has a paraplegic from incident. Uh, when he was young, he had uh, uh, brain surgery. And uh, he had, it seems to me uh, he had ended with uh, lower limb uh, weakness and paralysis. He had a spastic uh, paralysis. Uh, this guy, uh, although he had paralysis, but still there is some uh, sensory uh, still uh, uh, maintained uh, lower limbs uh, as well the bowel bladder uh, function. He's a smart guy. Uh, he came uh, several times to my clinic, insisting uh, that uh, he want to have uh, uh, corrective surgery because uh, it seems to me that uh, he had a developmental uh, kind of uh, scoliosis, uh, which we call it the de novo scoliosis. Um, he has no, uh, uh, it has been recorded uh, with the time that he had the progressive uh, deformity that affecting even his uh, uh, lung. So, uh, past medical history, as we mentioned, uh, uh, he had uh, kyphoscoliosis, it could be uh, 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 polymyelitis or uh, residual uh, paraplegia uh, from uh, the previous uh, surgery. Uh, he had two, type 2 respiratory failure. Uh, second to chest uh, deformity. Uh, he had a restrictive pattern, uh, pattern uh, and he is on the home oxygen. Uh, previous history of DVT, uh, he is on the zero to uh, hypertension, and sometimes the, the blood pressures keep uh, jumping. It's sometimes uncontrolled. Um, we did echo for him. Uh, his uh, uh, EF is uh, 55 to 60 percent. Uh, he had uh, also, uh, there's a mass in the lift. Uh, uh, Lung, which is not affecting uh, him, and he was ex smoker. He quit one year ago, so uh, he keep coming uh, to my clinic for nine months, complaining uh, that uh, the deformity is progressive. Uh, um, now his uh, uh, respiration, uh, uh, the lung function and the lung capacity become even uh, weaker. Uh, he's more and more demanding on the oxygen. He went to the um, uh, pulmonary uh, pulmonologist and uh, they did pulmonary function test and they uh, sent him to me as a surgical correction for his deformity uh, can improve his lung, uh, lung function. I tell you what, when I looked at the guy and his, his x-ray, um, you, can, you can see here his, uh, his x-ray, I wasn't so really... Um, happy to touch uh, a difficult and challenging uh, situation. Um, it's not because of the deformity, it's uh, because of his comorbidities, uh, the lung function, and uh, uh, he had also chest infection several times. He was admitted uh, about six to seven times. Uh, when he came to me, uh, his lung uh, was clear. Uh, and this is what uh, we have. If you look at the x-ray here, uh, this is the uh, mid sagittal line. You can see uh, the pelvic uh, uh, it's tilted uh, to the right side. Uh, here, the, the curve, uh, the lumbar here, uh, and uh, uh, it's about uh, 80 degrees, uh, similar at uh, the thoracic uh, level. Um, the lateral bending view, you can see it's uh, really stiff uh, uh, curved. Uh, he's just using his pelvis uh, 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 for tilting, actually. Uh, if, if you look here as a comparing, when you look at the lateral view here, you can see there is a huge gibbous. So he has three deformities. The first one at the thoracic. The other one is at the lumbar level. And also he had uh, uh, kyphotic deformity. So um, after uh, reviewing his uh, CD scan, um, you can see the 3D CD scan. I just uh, choose uh, some of the cuts here. So it, it will be the deformity. You can see it uh, more mm -hmm. clear here. You can see how, how the deformity here, uh, the, uh, the two levels here from the sagittal. And uh, you can see there's a bone fusion here. Look at the, the lamina here. The lamina here is fused with the, with the facet. So this is a really a stiff curvature at this level. But here, it's flexible. So uh, the, the thoracic level uh, keep uh, uh, increasing the, the curvature. Uh, this affects even his uh, sitting. You see the, the, the way how the build it looks like. So he had more pressure at this uh, area and it started causing some uh, pressure. So, so this guy, his life actually is really miserable.
So uh, you can see here the, the CT scan. We did the chest CT scan for him. We did the ECG echoes uh, before we decide uh, to, uh, to proceed with the, any uh, surgical plan. So, uh, Ahmed, what do you think? It's a very challenging case. Uh, if I get this case, definitely I'm going to refer it to someone else. But uh, yeah, the, the most things that uh, strike me and scares me is the, that uh, he has a lumbar kyphosis. And yes. uh, that's the most challenging, uh, I think. So, um, uh, for the speakers, uh, do you have any suggestions? What would you do in the, the situation? Do you have any thoughts and ideas? Uh, it's a very stiff, of course, curve. So, uh, if you want to do something, uh, it's going to be uh, the big surgery. So, uh, it's a kypho It's a mainly lumbar kyphoscoliosis with probably compensatory thoracic uh, curve to the other side. So uh, it started in the lumbar area and that's why I think it's kyphotic in the lumbar area. So most yeah. probably if you want to do something, you will need to do uh, a vertebral column resection at the apex of the, of the deformity, like around maybe L3, L2 or L3, something like this, because it's the only way to make it flexible. It's rigid, the discs are fused, the laminas are fused. So if you want to do something, you will need to uh, to proceed with the most aggressive uh, procedures, which is going also to be very difficult to correct with all the risks. But you said he's paraplegic or something like this, so maybe the risks are not very important if he's uh, in the wheelchair. Yes, that's what makes me even more uh, uh, to accept the challenge. Uh, in this yes. And yeah, yeah, also, true. if you look here, look at the ribs here. Uh, that rib is hitting the, the pelvis and it's causing pain. Actually, yeah. and this is one it's of the major, yes, conflict. and this, yeah, and this is one of the major uh, things that uh, similar cases they come to, to your clinic. It's not just the deformity, the lung, and the pain at the uh, costal pelvic uh, uh, region. So, uh, any other ideas, Dr. Salah? Well, I think it's really uh, challenging, but uh, if uh, I may say, it's. Uh, I will try my best to go from uh, <clears throat> to minimize the uh, the number of surgeries for him because probably he needs more than one stage or two stages. So uh, maybe two pieces on from the lumbar and uh, another piece on the thoracic, and uh, we'll see. But it is really difficult. It needs a lot of planning. VCR is good, but I don't know if he can manage to go for one VCR or more, which is too much for the patient. So a lot of bleeding and yeah. I think the point here for this patient, since he's paralyzed, he uh, is the main thing is the sit uh, sitting, uh, uh, is the sitting for him. So uh, surgery is indicated for this patient for seating. Is that the reason, Dr. Basi? Because he's yeah, sitting. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, uh, actually from the, the first uh, visit, I wouldn't touch uh, this patient because uh, it's uh, challenging and as uh, my colleagues, they mentioned about the difficulties and need uh, pre-planning. But uh, as Ahmed, you mentioned, yes, one of the problems is the sitting. You can see the pelvis here is uh, tilted and uh, also the pain from the rib here. And the third reason because of the lung uh, shortness of breath and uh, uh, it's uh, causing more uh, restrictive uh, lung disease. So there was someone three. Argue, yeah, someone will argue why are you gonna operate on someone who's not uh, moving or he's not a walker. But uh, we do this a lot in a, a pediatric neuromuscular cases that we do the surgery only for so we can let the child sit comfortably. And uh, yeah. I think this is the situation here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, yeah, this is this is why uh, because of these three reasons, I start to look again and the study. If you look here, at this curve here, uh, the lumbar here. Uh, so we we are dealing with one curve here, uh, the upper thoracic here. We have one curve, and the third one here, it's uh, the thoracolumbar area. It's uh, concave. So uh, I thought um, if I manage to do medical subtraction to me, and I managed to do three actually. Uh, I did one here and I did the witch osteotomy to the side. So 
uh, I, I played with the Vidika subtraction instead of uh, taking the higher zone uh, from the posterior to anterior, I take it from right to left. And then I did three actual Vidika subtraction of circuit one at the apical point here, the second one at the thoracic at C7, at T7, 8, and uh, at the thoracolumbar T12, I did the third one. So I managed to, yeah, as we mentioned before, that we are not, I think, uh, uh, Salah, he mentioned that we are not targeting to bring a person uh, imperfection. We are trying to solve uh, his complaints, and his complaints is uh, the pelvis, uh, reduce the pressure on the lung, and push away the rib. So uh, you don't have to look for perfection, just try to move it away, uh, um, and the patient will accept any outcome. Uh, try to reduce the, the time of the surgery, uh, do it at one stage if you can, and uh, just run away. So, um, this is what we have done. And if you look here, we managed to push, I, I have another excel I'll try it a uh, few later, but if you look at the builders here, it's becoming almost parallel with the, with the ground here. So the pressure become more um, equalized at both sides. You can look here at the, the, the upper side, at the shoulder level here, it's uh, almost level. Uh, the, the things that after we did the osteotomy, if you look here, the gibbous has been uh, uh, corrected. Yeah. And if you look at uh, this level here, uh, here the challenge is that uh, when I put the rod, that one, I, I used also uh, screws at the iliac. When I put the rod here, you see this one from the right side, that rod, it moved while I'm going up. I moved to the, to the left side, the screws, then I went back to the right side. When I put the rod this side, uh, at, at the left one, I put it at the pelvic and the L5, uh, and then I jumped here, and then I connect back to the left side. Then I put the third rod here, and I put a connector to hold this curve to prevent it from uh, getting worse. Uh, believe me, with three medical subtraction osteotomy, this is the best you can have. But at least the patient, after the surgery, his uh, lung function uh, it, uh, came back uh, to uh, improve, actually. Improved about uh, 40%. His uh, pelvis uh, become more uh, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with, the, with the ground, you can see here, uh, at this level. Uh, as well, the ribs came away. So, uh, and he became even taller. So he was so happy, um, the, the patient. Uh, unfortunately, these cases, uh, it's really a challenging uh, case. You can see here, it's uh, becoming more uh, corrective. And uh, because of a previous uh, history of repeated infection, he developed uh, infection at the lower end. And once you have infection, this is a nightmare. And uh, I took him uh, uh, twice for uh, deprivement, but uh, unfortunately, his lung could not uh, stand for uh, uh, the major surgery. And uh, because of his restrictive uh, lung disease, uh, he went with the uh, lung infection and didn't do, do well uh, uh, eventually. So uh, my, my message here, uh, if, if you do, uh, if you take a case similar to this, uh, you have to really uh, be careful uh, what you are uh, going uh, for. Uh, is the lung uh, really uh, uh, can compensate uh, the correction, the age, uh, if the patient smoker or it's smoker or not? Uh, the the heart uh, the injection uh, also a percentage is it uh, really uh, uh, is his heart can compensate also a major surgery think about uh, doing one uh, one stage but usually at the end uh, even with this kind of uh, aggressive uh, correction and improving the lung capacity sometimes they don't do well thank you thank you dr basi uh, i um, uh, there's few uh, questions, but uh, more of comments. And one of the questions, uh, maybe we missed that. Uh, what was the cause of paralysis in this patient? Uh, he had, uh, there was a, a query, because when I asked the patient about the past history, uh, it, it, it could be a polio, uh, one of the reasons. And uh, the other reason he mentioned that he had uh, a brain surgery. I think he had uh, hydrocephaly and they did, uh, uh, they did uh, what they call it, the uh, cervical uh, the tubes. Uh, drainage and it was infected and they remove it uh, uh, later after uh, 11 months. Okay. So what it was really, there is no documentation about what's uh, the, the actual cause of his paralysis. And his neuro did not change after surgery? 
No, no, because uh, this is uh, he is forty forty four years. Uh, so that they're talking about something happened uh, forty uh, three years. Uh, uh, someone wants you to more elaborate on the third road. Why did you use it? Okay, the third road here. Uh, you see, there is uh, when we put the road here. You can see there is uh, a gap between uh, that screw, which is about uh, T uh, L L two and between the iliac and uh, this will cause more stress on the road uh, at this level here so to uh, to share the the pressure and the stress here so i put uh, uh, conjoined the road here the, the small one here and i put a cross link because even if you if you try it's it's very hard to make a road uh, uh, curve and uh, going up uh, it you will cause more stress and uh, you can end with the road failure so it's better in this situation, try to keep the road uh, straight as much as you can, use uh, 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 adjacent uh, road, and by this way, the, the, the stress will be shared between both of them. Okay, uh, we will conclude now. I would like to thank you all, uh, thank you, uh, all for this uh, wonderful uh, webinar, uh, and I would like to congratulate you and myself on a successful uh, webinar. We reached about uh, 760 uh, attendants. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Basi from Dr. Salman Faqih Hospital in Jeddah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sahadin Khalifa from King Abdullah Medical City in Mecca. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Basha uh, from King Fahad Medical City in Daman. Thank you, Dr. Anwar. Uh, from uh, Kingdom Hospital in Riyadh. Thank you, Dr. Samir from uh, National Guard Hospital in Riyadh. Thank you, Dr. Ali Shaibi from uh, King Fahd Medical City in Riyadh. Uh, and uh, inshallah, we'll do uh, more uh, webinars. Uh, and uh, there is one coming up uh, in the next uh, 10 days. It will be about uh, cervical radiculopathy in a uh, young age it will be a multidisciplinary uh, webinar uh, inshallah a link uh, and a regist a regist a link for registration will be sent out soon thank you everybody assalamu alaikum thank you